In this video, we're going to explore two commonly used conventions for describing the arrangement of notes in any particular scale. The number system, one through seven, and solfege, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the piano and we're going to build up an understanding of what these systems are and especially what they are not. We're going to compare them to each other. We're going to talk about their pros and cons. And then ultimately, we're going to talk about the limitation that both of these, at the highest musical level, even though they describe in mechanical terms the arrangement of a scale, both of them still fall short of the concrete reality of what's happening when we actually perform music. Got it? So let's go to the piano. It's going to be fun, I promise. The first thing you have to know is this, whether we're talking about the number system or the solfege system, is that both of these systems use the major scale as the common point of reference. And so to illustrate what's going on here, I've chosen to lay out the C major scale. Could have been any other major scale, but here we have, just to keep it simple, C major. All white notes. And let's look at both systems, right? So the convention is simple. Starting with the root of the scale, you count up in sequence. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight, which is really one, because it's the same note, same letter name, C, right? Now in contrast, the solfege system assigns single syllable, one syllable names to each of the same notes. So let's, let's do the same. Again, C is Do, it's the root of the scale, and it also defines the key center, right? Do, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, and then Do. Same note, Do, Do. Got it? And so, just for the moment, just accept that whether we're talking about the number system or the solfege system, these are two commonly used conventions for describing the same musical stuff. In this case, a major scale. Got it? Great. So before we expand on this foundation that we've built using the major scale as a point of reference, I want to make some critically important points about the process of naming things, whether it's using numbers or letters or names or anything, right? So the first point is this. These numbers and these syllables are totally arbitrary. Totally arbitrary. Right? In, in, in the following sense. Instead of numbers, we could have easily said red, green, blue, purple, orange, yellow, uh, pink, and oh, whatever I started out with number one, right? And instead of the solfege syllables, we could have said uh, Lucy, Ricky, Fred, Ethel, Ozzy, Harriet, right? Bert and Ernie, right? So that's the key point. Names. Names are always arbitrary. There is nothing magical or special about any of these names. They are just commonly used conventions that allow us to communicate with each other using the left side of our brains. Got it? Great. Another thing to be aware of before we go forward is this, that our chosen point of reference, namely the major scale, is purely arbitrary. Right? It's reasonable, but it's arbitrary. Um, right? our, our scale reference point could have easily been the natural minor scale, or a Dorian, or Mixolydian scale, or any, any other scale for that matter. In fact, it could have been all 12 notes, right? It could have been a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 scale, right? But it's not. And the reason it is, is it's an historical artifact of how the music theory was developed in series with the development of classical music in Europe at the time. The reason, quite reasonable, is simply this. The major scale was probably the most commonly used tonality 
for all the musics that were created. And so for that reason, its choice as the common point of reference, although arbitrary, is quite reasonable. Got it? Great. Another thing I want to share with you is a couple of cautions regarding the use of the number system. And there's, there's two possible misapprehensions that might arise from the use of sequential numbers rising left to right. And these can lead to two distortions regarding our understanding of music theory and how it relates to how music actually works. So the first misapprehension is this. Don't assume that there's something special about going up a scale. Right? We could have easily gone down the scale. We could have gone 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Right? The other thing that you don't want to read too much into is this. Don't assume that a scale is always going to be a linear construct. No, it's not. In fact, as you'll see in other lessons, scales are as much a harmonic construct, in fact, more so a harmonic construct, than they are a linear melodic construct. So here's an example. Uh, let's pull two notes out. Let's get rid of the four and the seven. What do we have? We have a C pentatonic major, C major pentatonic scale, without a four and without a seven. Got it? Great. So now let's go ahead and build upon our knowledge of these numbering and naming conventions based on the major scale and ask ourselves, what about the in-between notes? In other words, these guys, these five notes. How do those guys get, get named? Well, it depends. And it depends on whether we're going up the scale or down the scale. So let's take a look. So let's start by going up the scale. And just let's just walk, let's just do it. Use the just do it method. So we're gonna go one, sharp one, two, sharp two, three, sharp three just happens to be four. Just a quirk of music. Just don't question it, just run with it. So we've got four, sharp four, five, sharp five, six, sharp six, seven, and then sharp seven just happens to be one again. And by the way, all these names, all, sorry, all these notes, in between notes, also have solfege names. And guess what? Those solfege names are variations of the, the root solfege that the note is based on. And so, for example, notice that Do sharp is D. Re sharp is Re. Fa sharp is Fi. So sharp is C, La sharp is Li. So notice, D, D, R, R, F, F, S, S, L, L. Got it? Great. So let's do the same thing coming down and name the same notes. So now we're coming down, so we're going to use flats. All right, so we go one, seven, flat seven, six, flat six, five, flat five, four, three, flat three, two, flat two, one. And now let's do solfege. Now again, the solfege names are based on the accidentals of the, the note we use as the point of reference. So let's see, we're gonna go do flat, just happens to be T. T flat is T. La flat is le, so flat is se, fa flat just happens to be me. Again, just run with it, don't question it, it's just the way the music works out. Mi flat is me, re flat is ra. And again, notice, t, t, la, la, s, s, m, m. R, R. Got it? Great. So now let's go ahead and pull all this together by realizing that now we have a complete system. 
using either numbers or solfege for naming not just the diatonic notes in the major scale, but also the in-between notes. And we can name those in-between notes using either sharps or flats. Depends on whether we're playing the scale ascending or descending. And by the way, what you're looking at is nothing other than the chromatic scale, which includes all possible notes in a given octave. Right? So, now, now let's go ahead and let's just do a few examples of some very specific scale types and how those are defined using both the numbers and, uh, sorry, number and sulfate system. Right? So, here we go. Let's go ahead and remind ourselves, here's the major scale, so where do those notes? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Meaning, it looks like this, right? Great. So, now let's do a, this is how it just happens to be the natural, what's called the natural minor scale. So we've got a flat three, a flat six, and a flat seven. So we've got do, re, me, fa, so, le, te, do. Got it? Let's do another fun example. Something a little more exotic. So this is a Japanese scale. Ready? So we got a one, flat two, guess what? No three. Four, five, flat six, no seven. Let's have a listen. Got it? So those are just three examples of dozens of possibilities. Dozens of possible ways to divvy up all the 12 notes in a given octave to create a whole variety of scale types. Got it? Great. So I'd like to close this video out with just three general comments. Comment number one is this. I know this seems like a lot of work to do, right? But it's not, and I know that. I bet you already know a lot of your major scales. You know where the notes are. And I bet you already know how to count to seven. And I bet you already know not just do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, but you know what those notes sound like. Do, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Guarantee you, you know that. Kindergartners know how to do that. So, the only thing left really is to figure out those, in, those pesky little in-between notes. But guess what? There's only five of them. How hard can that be? And by the way, this pattern holds no matter what key you're playing in. Which brings me to the second point, and that is this. The critical importance of mastering your major scales because they are the common point of reference and the point of departure for understanding all the other scale types, right? And then point number three and the final point is this. Even though we're talking about names and theory and conventions and arbitrariness, I want you to realize this. At some point, all this stuff is going to be abandoned, just like you abandon training wheels when you're learning to ride a bicycle. Because the concrete experience of playing music, the concrete experience of the sound and the sound feelings, the concrete experience of moving our bodies, the concrete experience of where those notes are in terms of vis visuospatial layout on the piano, all those things lie in a realm beyond all the left-brained constructs of things like names. At some point, you're going to internalize all these patterns, and all that's going to be left is the pure experience of sound, feeling, and motion. And I promise that. I promise that. Um, and, I, and I'll leave you with this. Don't worry if you don't have all this grasped right now. It's all going to come together because in my subsequent videos and in a bunch of lessons on my website, 
these number systems and the solfege systems are going to show up again and again and again. There's going to be so much overlap and so much mutual reinforcement that you're going to wonder, not years from now, but probably maybe days and weeks from now, you're going to wonder why it seemed so hard. Got it? Great.